Hey, my name is Jay Warner Wallace, and I'm the author of Cold Case Christianity. I, I gotta tell you, if you're listening to this radio, you know that you're in a good place, and I cannot endorse more highly the intellect and the passion of your host. So just enjoy this radio program. Is he a real one? Radio is the real thing. And Veda, thank you so much for doing the most important work of the kingdom. Hello out there, this is Bobby Conway. You're listening to Is He a Real One Radio? And I'm now passing the baton off to my man, Veda. Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. How are you doing? I hope that all is well with you. I pray that all is well with you. My name is Veda Hedgman of Is He a Real One Radio? And I want to thank you so much for tuning in. We have a very, very, very special episode here for you on today. But before we even get to any of that, I want to thank you so much. If you are tuning in on iHeartRadio and you are listening, thank you. I praise the Lord for you. If you're listening on Spotify, if you're listening on iTunes, if you're listening on the TuneIn app, we want to welcome you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And of course, if you're listening and watching on YouTube, I want to wave at you because you can see my face and you will also be able to see the beautiful faces of my guests on today. Now, I have two friends who are coming on on today. Two friends who have a different view of uh, scripture of a very important topic. OK, now I interviewed Sam Shamoon relatively recently on Is He a Real One Radio? And we discuss is the Trinity a real one? Is the Trinity a real one? And towards the end of, you know, uh, the interview with Sam, you know, I said, you know, I would love to be able to have someone who is well versed in an opposing view to be able to dialogue with Sam and by the grace of the Lord and Savior, you know, um, we have that in in Roger Perkins. So these are two distinguished teachers who have presented on this topic hundreds of times. They have debated this topic multiple times, countless times. And, you know, they're 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 very familiar with the objections. And we want to have a space where where these two um, brothers in humanity are able to dialogue and discuss scripture. Now, you're you should be familiar with Sam Shamoon if you're listening to this channel, because, like I said, he was just on. Uh, I will also uh, introduce Roger Perkins shortly. You may know him from debating James White and other <clears throat> excuse me, and other presentations that have gone viral. And I will get to them in a second, allow them to introduce themselves a little further and and describe their position in greater detail. But before I get to them, I want to say a couple things to the listeners. All right. If you're listening to this, my prayer and my challenge to you is that you listen to the arguments of both teachers with an open heart, regardless of where it is, where what your position is. I pray that you listen with an open heart. And listen with an intent to with an intent to reason with the scriptures. I, obviously, I do have a view. I'm not here to necessarily promote my view on this particular episode. I am here to facilitate a doctrinal discussion. But my prayer for you as a listener and as a viewer is that you don't have a, a loyalty to what you have been taught by your pastor or by your grandmother that you haven't necessarily studied a whole lot. If you grew up Trinitarian, you know, listen to listen to both of these teachers as they as they uh, break down the scriptures that we're going to go over. If you grew up oneness and you never really dived into it and you never really dived into Trinity, you just heard things about it or whatever. Again, regardless of how it lands, my prayer is that you don't go into a loyalty to something that you just have because somebody who you cared about taught it to you. That's actually reason with the scriptures. You're not just going to go with something because Roger said it or because Sam said it and it sounded good. No, this is one of many study tools, but the final authority is the word of God. Amen. So uh, I also pray that that you don't go into this into listening to this with an attitude of we cannot know. Oh, well, I cannot know if God is a triune God. I cannot know if God is just one. It really don't matter. I don't know. God left us 66 love letters, but he's not clear enough to explain it. My prayer is that you don't go into that with that attitude either. Let's actually listen to these teachers. Uh, these are two, again, these are two distinguished teachers who have presented on their position hundreds of times, and they are going to dialogue on certain scriptures that they view differently as it relates to 
God being a Trinitarian God? Is, is God a Trinity or is God one in three different modes? And if I've said anything, Sam or Roger, that you feel like misrepresented what you guys uh, believe, please feel free to correct me uh, when you open up. So I just wanted to make that clear before we get started. So both gentlemen have agreed to not call each other names, to not cut each other off. Um, we're not going to call each other heretics, you know, but if someone says something that we think is heretical, we are going to demonstrate with the Bible why we think that teaching is inaccurate. So this is all about the Bible. This is all about scripture. What does scripture actually say? With all that said, with that long intro said, I am super duper excited, y'all. I am super duper excited. So the first thing we're going to do right now uh, before we go to the scriptures that we're going to discuss is we're going to have both Sam Shamoon and Roger Perkins introduce themselves. After they introduce themselves, they will have four minutes, excuse me, if it takes that long to simply uh, describe what is their position so when I, i'll go to roger first and he will say what is oneness and why does he believe it's true uh he has up to four minutes to do that after that sam will do the same thing he he will describe what is the trinity and why does he believe it's true and then after that i will go into the specifics and the rules of our discussion so with that said roger um i'm going to unmute you how are you doing my man good how are you i'm doing fortunate man i'm a blessed guy no complaints at all so i'm going to let you introduce yourself a little bit i won't start your time until you start going into what is oneness so introduce yourself a little bit then you can just describe what is oneness and why you believe it's true roger perkins you've already heard that um pastor in oregon I uh, pastor some very precious people in Oregon and um, still doing apologetics, still trying to um, uh, go further in my classes and courses um, on original languages, exegesis, et cetera, et cetera. I'm currently in second year Greek and uh, just finished up first year Hebrew and then now taking a class in uh, Hebrew exegesis, took one in New Testament exegesis, took one in textual criticism. So I've been pretty busy, but it's a passion that I have. So um, I think that's about it. Uh, oh, I have a blog, apostolicacademics.com, where I deal with a lot of the stuff um, with original languages, post diagrams, etc. So if you're interested in that, apostolicacademics.com. Um, I also want to say before I start, I have enjoyed my interaction with uh, Veda. Mr. Hedgeman, he's been uh, nothing but a gentleman to me, and uh, I hope that I can do the same thing regarding him. And looking forward to interacting with Mr. Shamoon. So let's roll. You ready? Yeah. So let's go into what is oneness and why do you believe it's true? Okay. Um, so the de uh, the definition from my perspective of of oneness theology. Is and, and a lot of this you've already heard from me, but the the old we always start with the Old Testament. I'm more of Trinitarians do the same thing, but we start with the Old Testament in that it is our tutor, as Galatians would say, to lead us to Christ. So the Old Testament was the epistemologic framework of the New Testament writers. They would propound a doctrine and then they would say, For it is written, uh, appealing back to the Old Testament uh, scriptures. Um, so if we start, for example, with Genesis 1, 1, the, the second Hebrew word in the entire Bible is barach. It is uh, create. Now, so English would be in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And interestingly, that Hebrew verb is actually a masculine singular person, third person uh, uh, conjugation. So right at the very beginning, the second word in, in the word of God, the Hebrew text and as well the Septuagint, by the way, uh, indicates that we have one creator. We have one person created. It's not just enough to say one creator. Uh, Trinitarians will tell us all day long. We believe in one God. So it, it's further than that. It goes further than that. Um, and then, of course, we could go to the Shema, 
Um, and I know that you guys are well familiar with that. I would assume that the audience is as well. Um, so just English to hero, Israel, the Lord, our God is one Lord. But here's the catch. You have, after the Shema and explaining the, the Shema, you have single person pronouns applied to what Moses just said. This is the identity of Yahweh. And he uses single person pronouns. Um, one of the things that's missing, in my opinion, and I got to hurry, but one of the things that's missing in Trinitarian presentations is that from the Old Testament, they will quote, you know, the Shema, the usually Isaiah 40 through 45, etc. But they don't they don't include the single person pronouns. And that that to me is is really where the rubber meets the road. Uh, so I could go as well. Isaiah 40, 45. Single person pronouns. Oh, by the way, Septuagint uses the masculine singular haste for the adjective of one. And um, we could look at Isaiah 43 and 10, uh, all the different scriptures. See, I, Isaiah 43, 10, I don't have it copied down, but I think it says beside me, I even I am the Lord and beside me there is no savior. And again, you have single person pronouns. From our perspective, what we would say is, is Yahweh being honest here? Did, did he for 4,000 years of Hebrew history, approximately, uh, tell his people over and over using single person pronouns, I'm one and you don't worship any more than me. I'm one. I created all by myself, all alone. Again, single person pronouns. Um, and, and then in the New Testament, all of a sudden that switches. And now we've got two other persons that wasn't known in the Old Testament. Now, I'm well familiar with Alan Siegel's, um, what is it, Two Powers of Heaven. I've got it. In fact, I've also got scathing rebukes of it uh, in exegetical format as well. Um, if the listeners are copying or taking notes, I would ask them to look very closely at Isaiah 45, 21. It, uh, Isaiah 45, 21. So what you have here, let me get to the thing. So English, tell and bring forth your case. Yes, let them take counsel together. Who has declared this from ancient time from then? Let's see. Who has told it? Have not I, Yahweh? And note this. And there, oh, is that my time? Yeah, you can finish your thought, though. You can finish your thought. Okay. Okay. So uh, what did he say? He said, who has told it? Who has told it? Have not I, Yahweh? And there is no other God beside me. And that, and then he goes, he goes on to say, a, a just God and Savior. Interestingly, whenever he says it, one term is, is God, is Elohim. And then the other term is uh, when he says there's no one beside me, single person pronoun, and it's El. There is no plurality in El. So you have El, single person pronoun, saying there is no plurality beside me. Um, I've got tons of more stuff, but that's All right. it. All right. So thank you for that, uh, Roger. Thank you for that. So at this point, Sam, I'm going to unmute you. So if you can introduce yourself yes. for a little bit and then you can <laughs> go into what is the Trinity? Why do you believe it is true? And thankfully, the if you push back on a couple of points that Roger said, no, I won't. it'll still be fair because, okay, okay. No, I, and I was going to say, I was going to say our, the scriptures are literally pointing out the, uh, that where, where, where well, he already began. Different on. No, he already so, began to ahead. make an exegetical case for his position. So I'll interact, but praise be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ. I trust the father of our Lord Jesus to anoint me by his spirit, to speak truth without error for the glory of Jesus Christ in Jesus name. <clears throat> now, I'm a full-time apologist. I got involved in apologetics because of Muslims. <clears throat> I started writing for a website called Answering Islam, which you can find, answeringislam.net, in 1999. And I've interacted with Muslims, Joe's Witnesses, and Oneness because common thread among all of them is <clears throat> an attack on the triunity of God. So that's what I've been doing by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's the Holy Spirit that qualifies me to do this, so he gets the glory for anything good I do, and all the mistakes and perfections are my fault. So may the Lord Jesus be glorified in that sense. Now, you can start timing me if you want. Let me know. All right. Okay. Yeah, and I'm glad that when I say opponent, I say this respectfully. I'm not saying my opponent, my enemy. You know, you understand. My opponent in this discussion, I am so glad he went to the Old Testament. I'm so glad he's studying Hebrew because he's going to make my case for me 
he's going to end up proving that the Hebrew language does not prove that God is a singular person because you heard the assertion that the singular verb bara in Genesis 1-1 means a singular person. No, it doesn't. It means a singular God because I'm going to demonstrate from the scriptures, the Old Testament being the foundation, because that's what I do. I try to prove the triunity of God from the Old Testament because the Old Testament is the foundation of the New Testament. And this silences not just modalists, but Jehovah's Witnesses and Muslims who all think the Old Testament supports their position. So contrary to what you hear, singular pronouns, singular verbs do not prove that God is a singular person because I'm going to demonstrate that you have the Hebrew Old Testament using singular verbs and pronouns and participles of entire nations. Nations are described with singular pronouns and verbs and participles, but no one in their right mind would think that that's referring to a single person. So just because singular verbs, pronouns are used of God doesn't mean he's a singular person. Notice he assumed that when he said, Singular creator, singular person. No, the creator is one, but he's not one person. Because on top of that, you will find, and he's going to help me confirm this, especially when we go to Isaiah, specifically Isaiah 54, 5, where you'll find plural participles used of God, plural verbs used of God, plural pronouns used of God. So for a Trinitarian, it poses no problem that singular verbs, pronouns are used of God. We would expect that because God is one. But now you have to define in what sense is he one? Is he one person or is he one being? And that being is shared by more than one person. But the problem for the modalists, as well as the Muslim, the Jehovah Witness, is that if their position is true, you should not expect to find plural pronouns, verbs, participles, used of God if it's a singular person. So again, let me repeat the point. From a Trinitarian perspective, we expect to find singular verbs, singular pronouns, Participles used of God because God is one in one way. But we should not expect to find plural verbs, plural participles, <clears throat> plural pronouns used for a singular person. And I'm going to challenge him on grammatical grounds to show me when in the Old Testament does it ever use plural participles for a singular person. It's used for collective singulars where you have several persons or a nation grouped together as a collective whole. So singular pronouns will be used in them and verbs as well as the plural. But that actually proves my point, that God is one in one way, but more than one in another way. So by the grace of the triune God, the only true God that exists, I will demonstrate the Old Testament does not teach God as a singular person, perfectly comporting with the New Testament that doesn't teach that God is a singular person. And so Mr. Perkins already knows what I believe is a Trinitarian, that there is one God, but this one God is more than one person or relationship. Now, I hope I don't have to define the term person because he already knows what we mean by person and what we don't mean by person. So hopefully we'll have a fruitful discussion. And I thank God he's studying Hebrew because he's going to confirm my arguments when I ask him to tell me what form do we find this word in the Hebrew. So by the grace of the triune God, let's begin so that Jesus Christ will be glorified. Awesome. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Here is what uh, we so here's going to be the format for so that you gentlemen are familiar with it as well as those who are listening. The format that we hold when we have these doctrinal discussions is we have select scriptures and we park on those scriptures. So there are countless debates, dialogues that you can find online and you can actually learn from them. You know, but we're going to park at certain scriptures. We're going to park at certain scriptures for 15 minutes at a time. And these two gentlemen are going to dialogue. Now, there will be a cap on how long they can ultimately talk. You know, so if if their response, it doesn't have to be two and a half minutes long. But if it happens to go that long, they'll hear me say, hey, you got to wrap up your thought uh, so that the other person can respond to you. So. We have uh, five or six scriptures and we're going to park there for 15 minutes out of at a time. And that's going to be our doctrinal discussion, how we're going to conduct this dialogue. Now, there are a couple of rules that these gentlemen have agreed to. Um, no name calling, as I've said already. No, no yelling. You know, we're not going to raise our voice and get out of character because uh, people who are listening and viewing won't learn that way. Uh, and we also we don't want to bring up uh, countless different scriptures from elsewhere when exegeting a particular text. Now, mind you, I want to put that in context. 
when exegeting a text, it is absolutely necessary at times to bring up something else from a different chapter or another book or maybe even a couple other books. That That is fine when it is necessary. The reason this rule is in place is so that someone, not saying you two gentlemen won't do it, but this is a rule anytime someone comes on so that someone doesn't start talking about eight different scriptures and never even focus on the scripture that's actually at hand. So with that said, our very first scripture, and I'm actually going to take myself out of the screen. Yes. And By the way, real quickly, uh, how many minutes for each scripture? I didn't get them. Forgot. The uh, we're going to we're going to park 15 minutes at a time. Oh, OK. Excellent. Yeah. 15 minutes at a time. And wait. So y'all. Oh. OK. Is he timing it already? Oh, yeah. Are you there? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Okay. Did he begin it? I don't know. I'm confused. Did he begin? I, I don't know. I have no idea. Same thing. Okay. Maybe you can tell us. Hey, did, is it starting? <clears throat> <laughs> I, get, I don't know. I have no idea. Could you okay. ask him to see if he was, your, your, your time is beginning or not? I have no idea. But anyway. Y'all couldn't hear me when I was talking? What's going on? Okay. All right. So even though this ain't live, okay, I think I just fixed it. I think I know what I did here. Yeah. All right. So I was still talking and y'all couldn't hear me. That's my bad. I apologize. No, so I'll, I'll say this again. All right. So Roger Perkins will have the first go okay. at this. And our scripture is Isaiah 44, 24. Now, again... We will be going, we will be parking here for 15 minutes, okay? And each gentleman, they respond. If they don't go up to two and a half minutes, that's fine. But two and a half minutes is the max that each person can go each time they ultimately talk. Roger, you have the first word. <clears throat> Excuse me. You have the first word. And again, the scripture here is Isaiah 44, 24. And the Bible says, thus says the Lord your redeemer who formed you from the womb. I am the Lord who made all things, who alone stretched out the heavens, who spread out the earth by myself. Roger, you have two and a half minutes to go ahead. Okay, number one, uh, well, I guess I can probably correct this later, but we do not go by the term modalist. We do not use the expression modalist. So we'll deal with that a little bit later on. And yeah, I'm glad that I'm studying Hebrew too, because it disproves the doctrine of the Trinity. Uh, I want to note here, verse 24, thus says the Lord. And when I click on says here, it is a katal third person, you listen, masculine singular. By the way, my opponent did not address the masculine singular that I brought up in Genesis 1-2. Um, redeemer here. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, Redeemer, masculine singular, who formed, who formed, cal participle, masculine singular participle. If he's going to emphasize the, the uh, participles and the, the parsing of them, then uh, I will too. That's what we need to do. This is masculine singular. You have a Noki, uh, I think that's a Noki, yeah. First person pronoun where he says, I am the Lord who made, who made cal participle masculine singular absolute things, who alone, alone, uh, common masculine singular construct, uh, stretched out cal participle masculine singular absolute, who spread out, et cetera, et cetera. For the sake of time, I could go right down the, the, uh, the line with this. There is, to my knowledge, no plurality in Isaiah 44 and 24, um, and so, I, and I do have a response for the for the uh, plurals that Mr. Shamoon quite often uses, but I won't address them right now. I'll just wait till we get into that. How much time do I have left, Veda? Okay, I, I don't know if he can hear me or not. Last thing, then, I, I would just ask Mr. Sh Mr. Shamoon to provide where. 
That that that, that was my bad. So you got you got a minute thirty seconds left, and again we're exegeting Isaiah forty four twenty four. Yeah. Oh, a minute and a half left. Okay, good. Um, so I, I would just ask Mr. Shamoon to provide an example of where a speaker is speaking, and he uses the singular first person pronoun to be more than one person. I'm sure he's going to go to Genesis five and Adam and Eve and all that, but I'll just wait until he goes there before I address it. Simply, the verbs are all conjugated in the singular masculine first person in this text. And there is additional information there as well. Uh, we could actually go to the Dead Sea Scrolls. There is a very powerful uh, text in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Scrolls, But I won't go there right now. Um, it, let's see. In other words, God is asking a rhetorical question. Okay, yeah. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, it said, who was a partner with me, single person pronoun, in creation, Davidson's Hebrew syntax, third edition, sections 20, uh, under the article, he says, words may be determinate in themselves or from construction, and with these, the article is not used. Note this, words definite of themselves are, A, proper names of persons, countries, cities, rivers, and then he gives the example in order, such as Yahweh, Moses, he says persons. And then he applies that to Yahweh of the Old Testament and then uses Moses uh, as well. Again, Barah is, in, is the first verse we have in the Bible about uh, creation. And it's masculine and singular. So that will, anything that comes after that will have to be uh, commensurate with that, with what it says in the second uh, verb in the Bible. All right. First so verb, I'm sorry. All right. So, Sam, you have an opportunity to respond. Sure. And I'll remind both gentlemen that when we are going back, that when we are conversing, we are talking about the specific uh, scriptures alone. We're, we're, we're not going different places. I'm saying that to both of you, gentlemen. Sam, you have an opportunity to respond. Go ahead. Yeah. By the grace of Lord Jesus Christ, I just want to correct him. I did address his claim about the singular verb bara, and I clearly stated that singular verbs do not prove that the creator is a singular person. He's assuming what he's yet to prove. Singular verbs, all they do is prove there's one creator. But is that one creator a singular person? He has yet to prove that. So now I'm going to prove my case from Isaiah itself. <clears throat> now, I don't know why he thinks the singular conjugation of Isaiah 44, 24 somehow refutes Trinitarianism. He knows what Trinitarianism teaches, so I hope he doesn't attack straw man, because we expect singular verbs, participles to use, of the one true God. What we don't expect to find if he's a singular person is when plural verbs, participles, <clears throat> and so on are used. So in Isaiah 54, 5, and I want him to conjugate this in his response to me, and I hope he doesn't say that's because it's corresponding to Elohim, because Elohim is not used <clears throat> in the sentence in which the plurals are used <clears throat> in Isaiah 54, 5. For your maker is your husband, the Lord of hosts is his name. So now we got the Lord of hosts is his name, but your maker and your husband are plural. They're not singular. It's the plural of Asa and Baal, because he knows that the word Baal can mean husband, lord, or master. So here you have the plural participle form of Asa and Baal. Literally, it's for your makers are your husbands. The Lord of hosts is his name. Exactly what a Trinitarian expects to find. The use of the singular and the plural together because the one God is more than one person, even though he's one God. But a oneness, because he got offended at the term modalist, a oneness <clears throat> shouldn't expect this if he's consistent. Because, again, if there's a singular person, then we shouldn't expect plurals use of, of Yahweh if he's a singular person. Now, to bring up cor corroborating evidence that the one creator is also identified as a plural creator, not more than one God, but that this one God is more than one person. Again, Ecclesiastes 12, 1. Remember also your creator. Surprise, surprise. The word creator here is the plural participle of bara, the very verb used in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. So literally, it's remember also your creators, exactly what a Trinitarian expects to find, that the one God, is more than one person, so that the Hebrew Old Testament will reflect that by using both singular and plural forms of these words for the one true God. But a oneness shouldn't expect to find this, and this is why he's going to have to try to explain it away. But again, it's not just Ecclesiastes or Isaiah. Now, here you have 
in Job 35, verse 10. But none says, where is God, my maker? Guess what? Here the word my maker is the plural participle form of asa, my makers. So again, this is what I'd expect to find if the Hebrew Bible teaches that one God is more than one person. But this is not what you should expect to find if oneness is true. And then finally, Psalm 149, verse 2. Let Israel be glad in his maker. Again, what do we have here? We have the plural participle form of Asa. So it's his makers. So as a Trinitarian, I expect to find singular verbs, participles, <clears throat> pronouns used of the one true God, along with plural. But I want to hear him explain how as a oneness he accounts for the plurals. And I hope he doesn't try to appeal to the word Elohim, because in some of these examples, Elohim is not used. I don't know how much time I have, but... I'll you stop right wrap now. It up now. Awesome. Roger, go ahead and respond. How much time do I have? Two minutes? Is that right? Yes, sir. Okay, good. Um, several points to address. Uh, for, uh, number one, it's not enough merely to say that there's a singular that is used in, for example, Isaiah 44, 24, where he, uh, that he, that the subject that we're talking about, the scripture we're talking about, it's a masculine singular. Mr. Shamoon did not include that in his presentation. Uh, so it's a masculine singular. Also, uh, I think you said Isaiah 54 and 5. Yep. You'll hear me. Okay. So I'm in the, okay. So for your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. Guess yeah. what his, yeah, exactly. Guess what his is. It's a masculine singular. And the Holy One of Israel, I hope he doesn't try the Holy One's thing that he pulls in Proverbs 30, but we'll see. The Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer, the God of the whole earth. He is called. Guess what we have, folks? Masculine singular. For the Lord has called you. Uh, regarding the, the, the husbands, let me, look, let me click on that and look. Husband. Verb. Yes. Good. Um, yeah, so, so this is a... Cal participle, masculine, plural construct. Exactly. We, we know that. Plural. Yeah, exactly. However, uh, the problem is that people like Mr. Shamoon, uh, other apologists that I'm well familiar with, they will appeal to the Septuagint when they think it supports them. For example, Genesis 126, etc. But why don't they do that here? You think there might be a reason? I think there is. The reason why is because guess what? You don't have a plural in the Septuagint. Neither do you have a plural in the Septuagint for Ecclesiastes 12 and 1. And finally, I would just say in response to him that if you're going to interpret this as multiple persons in the Godhead, then why stop at three? Why not have 3,000? You would have zero. Uh, you have no defense against polytheism. And I would imagine you're probably going to say, well, the same reason you uh, have three manifestations. But again, I don't want to address your um, argument that you're not making. So I'll just wrap it up by pointing out that we have masculine singular for the name and also for his call and many other things. I'm gonna look at maker here. Maker, yeah, yeah, uh, masculine plural, that's right. However, uh, the again, the Septuagint does not use that. So you can't appeal to the Septuagint when it supports your doctrine, or you think it does, and then neglect that same doctrine or a same source whenever you know, it, it refutes your doctrine. All right. Sam, go ahead. Yes. Two minutes. Uh, notice the bait and switch tactic here. He appealed to the Hebrew Old Testament. So I'm appealing to the Hebrew Old Testament. Now, notice I want everyone to pay attention to what he did. When the Hebrew Old Testament proved too much for him to handle, he ran to the Greek version. Let's put this in perspective. Let's put in context because I want the people to remember who appealed to the Hebrew language. Mr. Perkins did. So now I followed suit and I said, thank you for appealing to the Hebrew language because it's going to end up refuting you. And he just refuted himself. You see how what a big deal he made up? Well, it's a singular masculine, masculine singular. But did you hear he just admit that makers and husbands, they are masculine plurals. So what does the masculine singular prove? Absolutely nothing. It doesn't support your case. It supports mine. Masculine singular verbs and pronouns and participles is what a Trinitarian expects to find because there's only one God. But you as a oneness, that's why you ran to the Septuagint. See, now you abandoned the Hebrew because the Hebrew proved too much for you to handle. And I don't blame you because these plurals are a nightmare for oneness theology. 
So what you do, you abandon your appeal to the Hebrew because you're the one who said, I'm taking Hebrew and Hebrew exegesis and Hebrew grammar. And you appeal to the Hebrew and the conjugation is this. When I use the Hebrew to refute you, you ran to the Greek. So, but again, if you want to stick to the Greek version, that will be a nightmare for your position as well. But let me remind you what he just said. He just admit it's masculine plural. And I said, as a Trinitarian, I expect to find singular verbs, participles, <clears throat> pronouns, Use with plural ones if God is one in one way, more than one in another way. But that's not what you should expect to find if you are a oneness. And that's what he is. So, again, notice how he tried to make a big deal. Masculine, singular. But my friend, Mr. Perkins, maker and husband, they're masculine plurals. So what does the masculine prove? If they're plurals, that means what? There are three male entities? Or are you now abusing the language because you and I both know that the Hebrew term will often the nouns and the verbs and adjectives will often have gender assigned to it without telling us the gender of the thing that these verbs or pronouns or participles are describing. For example, in Hebrew, ruach is feminine. Should I, assume, should I assume that the Holy Spirit is a female? Wisdom is feminine. Hukma. Should I assume that wisdom is the woman, the consort of Yahweh? So again, you prove nothing. You prove my position. Yeah. And thank you for making my case for me. All right, uh, Roger, you get the last word on this. Two okay. minutes. Okay, yeah, this is a common theme in Mr. Shamoon's uh, presentations. He, I haven't listened to a presentation yet where he doesn't get up and say that. He says the same thing over and over, that we are making his position. No, we're not, friend. Uh, and you did not address the masculine singular of the second word in the Bible. I'm honest with it in saying, yeah, we have a masculine plural here. I'm not running to the Septuagint for safety. I quoted the Hebrew and was honest about that. But that does not prove a triune divinity. You are reading your presupposed theology into the text. Uh, and no Jew would believe that. And please appeal to Alan Siegel's work. I, I want you to. Um, so we have masculine singular. And he said the masculine doesn't matter. Are you serious? My professors would howl me out of the classroom if I made that statement. No, it does matter. Unbelievable. Uh, what else? Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Unbelievable. Exactly. Um, okay. Oh, oh, last thing. Um, the 9,000 single person pronouns. If God is a triune divinity, as, as Mr. Shamoon says, how on earth are you going to fit three persons into single person pronouns? And I know he's going to run to Genesis 5 probably, and I hope he does. But we're discussing Isaiah uh, 44, 24 tonight right here. And there is no plurality in Isaiah 44, 24 in the strongest way. He says, I, single person pronoun, masculine singulars, did all this by myself and no one was with me. Again, the second word in the whole Bible uses the masculine singular. So I understand you don't like the masculine singular. If I was a Trinitarian, I wouldn't either. However, uh, that's just the fact, my friend. That's just the inspired data. Your, your plural does not prove a triune triunity of persons again you might have three thousand why are you stopping at three so i would just wrap that up with that all right you was right on time you was right on time so thank you very much for that thank you very much for that so our next scripture and sam you will have the first go at this the next scripture that we're going to is a popular one we are going to exegete john chapter one verse one and let's park here and the word of god says in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god sam you get the first go at it what are we reading okay. here all right uh, hopefully by the grace of god and the interaction uh, later on when we interact i can get to answer some of the statements he made about the singular uh, again but anyway let's focus on john 1 1 <clears throat> let's do this and start the timer okay now here's the thing and I'm sure Mr. Perkins has heard this because he's debated others. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God, prostantheon. Now, he's aware of prostantheon, but here is what I want to ask him to address. Because from my understanding, the word is not an internal, distinct, divine person in fellowship with the Father before creation because that's not compatible with oneness. Now, you can correct me if he has a different form of oneness theology. I haven't heard. That's fine because I don't listen to his talks, or read his articles, but that's fine, by the grace of God. So, prostantheon. Now, why is this significant? And I want him to hear me clearly, because he does Greek grammar. Every time John uses 
Prostan Theon or Prostan Patera in reference to Jesus in John as well as in, in his epistle. It always refers to an actual face-to-face -face communion and not some simply an idea that becomes realized in historical Jesus. What do I mean by that? If you go to John 13, 3, it says, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God. Now, he knows the Greek here. Going back to God is pros tan theon. Now, why is this interesting? Because notice the parallel. It says that Jesus, know he had come from God and was going back to God. Now, I know Mr. Perkins will not have the audacity to say that Jesus going back to God isn't actual, that he didn't go to God, pros tan theon, as an actual person distinct from God in fellowship with God, unless he wants to say, that yes, he didn't go back as a person. I'll let him make his case so I can address it thoroughly. So then why then be personalized the first part of the sentence? He came forth from God and he's going back to God, prostantheon. Going back to God, if he's going there as an actual person in fellowship with the Father, then coming from God, he must have been an actual person in fellowship with the Father, which is precisely what John 1, 1 and 2 state. Now, finally, because I know time is running down, John 16, 25 to 31. Here, Jesus says he's not speaking in figures of speech. It's not figurative language. He's speaking plainly. And what does he plainly say? He goes, but I will plainly tell you about the Father. And that day you'll ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf. For the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and have come into the world. And now I'm leaving the world and going to the Father. So the leaving the world is actual and personal. And he's going to the Father as an actual person in fellowship with the Father. Right, so then why, why do you personalize the first part? If the second part is actual personal, then the coming into the world is actual personal. And then the disciples say, now you speak plainly. And because of this, we believe you came from God. Right. All right, Roger, go ahead and respond. Okay, yeah. Um, first place, uh, the, the, the John... One one thing, the proston theon. Now, let me say first, uh, maybe I didn't make it clear. In fact, I think I didn't make it clear in my opening statement. We believe there's a distinction between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So you can quote Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all day long. We believe that, but we do not believe God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Now, to his, let me go straight to his argument from John with the proston theon. I'm aware that he makes that argument quite often. So let me just point this out. He is, and he does this a lot too. He is conflating the categories. Whenever Jesus says in John, what was it, thirteen three, I think, in John thirteen three, I'm going back to God, Prostan Theon. That was a human being that was saying that. God in the flesh was saying, I'm going back to, or I'm going to Prostan Theon. To, by the way, Tan is the, to the God. Um, so using Mr. Shamoon's hermeneutic. If he's going to be consistent, he's going to have to say that in the first part of that clause, when Jesus came from heaven as a pre-existent son, he came as a human person. Because when it says in, in, in the second clause that he appealed to consistency of how we exegete the clauses, he says, well, that's a, you know, that, that's a person going to. Yeah, but it proves too much. It is, it's not just a person. It's a separate human being. It is a human being going, so I'm going to ask him to take his own medicine. If whenever Jesus is going to, that's a human person. When he came, was that a human person too? Same thing in Prostan Patera in John chapter 16. So that does not help him at all. That actually refutes uh, what he is saying. I know he thinks that's, a, that's an argument that's, that's earth-shattering. He uses it all the time, but it proves too much. Not to mention you would have separ uh, bodily separation within the Godhead with radically separated minds um he didn't really exegete anything other than proston theon so i'll just leave it at that i hope he addresses the rest of john 1 1 though yeah all right sam go ahead and respond yeah glory to jesus it is earth shattering but not for me but for his position because <clears throat> he claimed notice what he claimed see if i'm consistent he went back as a human being because that's a, that's going to backfire against him because he's admitting when he went back, he didn't simply go back in his idea. He went back as an actual person, which he calls a human being. The reason why I'm not inconsistent, but he is, and he just made my case, even though he doesn't like me to say he's making my case, is because John 1.1 1, 1 told us that when the word was with God, he wasn't flesh. Because 14 says he became flesh when he entered the world. So no, it makes my case, and you just made my case. I know you don't like to hear it, Mr. Perkins, but thank you for helping me prove the truth of the Trinity. Because John 1 says, <laughs> the word was with God. 
and he entered the world, that's when he became flesh. So now you're stuck. So here's my question again. Since you just admit prostantheon, prostant patera, in those passages, they're not figurative because he says, I'm speaking plainly, means Jesus went there as an actual, what you said, human being, but that means he's there, distinct from the Father, in your view as a human being, that means he went there personally to have communion with the Father. Why then do you depersonalize the first part? So I answered your objection, please answer mine, because it is earth shattering, but for your position. The word was not flesh, because 14 tells us he entered the world to become flesh. But he was there as a person in fellowship with God the Father, which your view cannot handle, cannot deal with. So if he went to the Father as a person, but this time as an embodied person, then the coming down to the earth means he must have been a person that came down, and that's when he became flesh. So thank you again for making my case for the Trinity. Glory to the triune God. Good. Do I get to respond now? Yes. Okay. Go good. Good. So, so you see now he's moving the goalposts. He doesn't like that because it proves too much. It's a human being. I'm asking you. You can go to John 14, 114. We're exegeting John 1, 1 now. And, and by the way, I haven't seen any exegesis of John 1, 1. Just simply quoting a prepositional phrase is not uh, exegesis. So whenever he goes back, you said it yourself. He's going back as a human being, God in the flesh. We believe that. We believe there is an ontological distinction between father, son, and, and, and well, the father and the son. Um, we also believe there's a distinction in the roles that they take, what Trinitarians would call uh, the economy, Trinitarian economy. So I don't really have any other response than to say he came down. We don't say, by the way, he came down as a merely a, an idea, uh, but it was the God that came down. Um, I wish we had time to get into the Colwell's rule and the missing article because I would love to, to get into that. But he came down as God. That's our point. He was not he was not the second person in a trinity. He was God. And John 1 1 says that. You know, I read John 1 1 for years. Never crossed my mind that this was distinct persons until I heard a Trinitarian say this. So the Logos was with, by the way, the God, Kai Theos, and God was the word. Um, I, again, I hope we come up with we can have a discussion on that. But this poses no problem. He said it himself. When he's going back. He's going back as the God in the flesh, the human Messiah. But when he's coming, he's coming as God Almighty. He's not coming as a member of the Trinity. He's coming back as the one God of the Bible. How much Sam, time go I ahead. Have? How much time I have before I go? This one's going to curious. Uh, you got two and a half minutes. Okay, yes. Now, notice, again, he misrepresented my position. He goes, as I said, he went back as a human being. This is recorded. People say, I said, no, as you said, I was quoting him. I'm not denying Jesus was a human being when he entered the world to become flesh. And then when he went back, obviously he was in his flesh body. You emphasized human being. And I said, thank you, because now you're admitting that the going back was the going back of a person, not simply an idea. Now, here's what's ironic. I will challenge anyone to understand anything Mr. Perkins said about the exegesis of John 1.1. 1, 1. He said that the word is God Almighty in the flesh, but it doesn't mean the second person, the Trinity. I guess he didn't understand the point of me referring to the preposition, and I was doing exegesis. The word was with God. If he's with God, that means there's a distinction. Just like he believes the human being, Jesus, went to heaven to the Father. So you have a human Jesus with the Father. Unless he's telling me, Somehow that human being who's in fellowship with the father is simply the father in fellowship with himself in a different mode, even though he doesn't like the term. So if Jesus is distinct from the father when he prostantheon, prostan patera, when he went back to heaven, then that means John 1, 1 shows that the word is a distinct person from the God he's with. And we know who the God he, he, he is with happens to be because John 1, 14 says the word became flesh. And we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father. And this is confirmed in 1 John 1, 2, where it says the eternal life that was with the Father, prostan patera. So the word was with the Father, and the word is not the Father, even before creation, even before he became flesh. He is a divine person in fellowship with the Father who becomes flesh and then returns in flesh to resume that fellowship and communion. Welcome to the wonderful world of the Trinity, not oneness. Glory to the Chinese God. Go ahead, Roger. I'm confused here. Hold on one second. Can you hear me? 
I can hear you. I thought that I get the last word because in the last session, right. you didn't let me. Yeah, you didn't let me respond. So what are you doing now? You do. He's going to respond, and then you get the last word. Oh, I thought this was rebuttal. Okay, go ahead. No, know, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, bro. I didn't know, man. man I thought it was already What's up, man? <laughs> go ahead, Roger. <laughs> so, so regarding, um, I didn't really even take notes because I thought it was his last time. But I think he said basically that when he's going back that he was he was quoting me actually when i said he's going back as a human being um that's exactly right and this proves the point he's coming in a different way in what he went back but mr shamoon is conflating the two and saying saying see here we have the same way of him coming if we have him going back no we don't you have him going back as a human being uh he is coming and when he came down he came down as god by the way prostantheon it's the definite article it's the articular now you have the tantheon so he was with the god which which we believe that but he was not with him as a second divine person that no one knew under the old testament i hope he goes to proverbs 30 at some point uh so you know i don't really know what to say beyond that jesus is god in the flesh we believe there's an ontological distinction between the father and the son um, regarding modalists, I'm just saying that we, I, I, we don't identify ourselves as modalists. That's why I objected to that. But we'll save that for later. So I don't really know what else to say. Um, I wish we had more time. We could just camp out on John 1-1. One, one. Maybe we can do that toward the end because I would really love to do that. Okay. Amen. All right, Sam, yeah, last how word. Much time I have now? Hold on. How much time I have now? I don't know. Uh, two and a half minutes. Okay, because I'm confused. Sorry, man. Okay, now let's begin. Notice again. <laughs> And I think Mr. Perkins, maybe because we're speaking fast, sometimes he's, I'm going to assume he's mishearing me. I didn't say Jesus went back the same way that he came down. I did not say that. This is being recorded. What I said is that the use of prostan, well, let me explain what I said. Prostan theon means that if the prostan theon means that he's going back to God as a person in fellowship with the Father, then the prostantheon John 1, 1 means that the word was there as a person in fellowship with the Father. So no, you don't believe that. You said you do. No, you don't. You don't believe the word is an eternal, distinct, divine person from the Father. You don't believe that. Because if you did, there would be no debate on John 1. But the use of prostantheon, and by the way, we're going to have a field day with Proverbs 30. So I will bring that up by the grace of Jesus. But sticking to this point. The use of prostantheon in John's gospel and his letters show that it refers to two distinct persons in fellowship with one another. When he uses it of the Father and Son, he doesn't simply mean there was the word there somehow in whatever form you imagine him to be because you don't believe he was a divine person distinct from the Father, right? Because his use means that this word was a person in fellowship with another person, that other person's God the Father, so he's not God the Father entered the world to become flesh, and then went prostantheon in flesh. So the difference is when he came down, he was in flesh. When he went back, he was flesh, but it's still a person who comes down and a person who goes up who's not the father but distinct from the father. You have yet to refute that. And so my point is established by the grace of the triune God. All right. Thank you all so much for that. So uh, just to make it clear, just so I can make sure um, both, both, both of you gentlemen – uh, know what we're doing so we got a few more scriptures left so what we're doing is each time you go you don't have to go up to two and a half minutes but okay. that is the maximum of th that you can go if you hit two and a half minutes i'm gonna ask you to wrap up your point and whoever i ask to go first is the person who's going to get the last word before we go to the next point so now, with before that you want, before you, before you, okay so they understand let's say if he goes first then i respond then he responds and i respond and then he closes yeah okay sorry i'm i apologize to mr perkins and you uh i didn't you know i didn't get the chance to read, so apologize to both of you i don't mean to you know i'm just trying to understand ah, so it's all good my brother it's all good and next roger you are going to be able to go first we will be going to colossians 2 9 and it's a short verse, and I'm sure as you exegete it, you'll bring it more into context. And Colossians 2, 9 reads as such. For in him, in Jesus, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. Go ahead, Roger. Oh, hold up, hold up. No, no, hold up. I muted you. I had you muted. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm go ahead. Really? Go ahead now. Yeah, go ahead now. I'm we sorry. good now? You guys hear me? Okay. Yeah. 
The Colossians do not. Hadi in alto, katoika, pantam, play, roma, teste, adate, somaticos. Literally, for in him the whole fullness of the divinity. This is what is often not pointed out. You have an articular noun, uh, they are theodotois, or theodotas, rather, uh, and it, it is an articular noun, so it's definitive, has a definitive uh, tag to it. So let me go to the syntax real quick. So it starts out with a subordinate clause. I think we all know what a hottie clause is. I would imagine Mr. Shimon would know that. It, it, it's expounding upon verse 8. Then you have the prepositional phrase, in alto, literally in him. Then you have what's called a segment clause, syntactically, where two clauses of the same type are juxtaposed by a conjunction or can be in what's called an ascend ascendetic relationship. So with that, you have, let me get straight to the prepositional phrase, pantan pleroma, or panta pleroma. Literally, all the fullness, taste theotitas, of the divinity or of the Godhead. So I, I don't, you know, I don't really see, um, honestly, how anyone could read that and would conclude that the Jesus is a second part or a second divine person in the Godhead. Whenever he is, uh, this right here says, no, he's all the fullness. I mean, nobody's going to read that, guys. And if they don't know a thing about the Bible and, and read that and say, oh, OK, there must be a, a trinity. There must be two, three persons in the Godhead. Nobody would do that. But yet, uh, and again, I'm not trying to be ugly. I hope I'm not coming across that way. But yet, that is exactly what a Trinitarians do. They they say, well, this is just saying he's divine. It's just saying it's Godhood, not Godhead. And so, um, but but it is an articular noun, theatetas. And if you know anything about Greek, it's, it's actually an attributive article. It is attributing to it definitiveness. Definitively, there is one person in the Godhead, and he is Jesus Christ. Because in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Just, it, it, it's just, it shatters Trinitarianism. Uh, let's see, a Greek word for pleroma, bower, uh, page 672. It denotes the full measure of divinity. Um, thought, let's Mr. see. Parker. Okay, so, okay, well, that's it. I'll just stop right there. All I'll right. stop. All right, Sam, go ahead and respond. Yeah, well, again, I don't want to take person because I actually enjoy his personality. I actually like Mr. Perkins. He's very animated, emotional like me, and I enjoy that. So don't take anything personal I say. But uh, I have to laugh again because did you notice the bait and switch again? He said that it means the, the articular <clears throat> shows it's definitive, definitively, and then he equates theodotos with person. Did you catch it? So that definitively he is the person. No, that's not what theodotos means. And this is why I'm kind of shocked because you say you're studying Greek grammar and syntax and exegesis and you're appealing to lexicons. Theodotos, here, I'm going to give you Thayer's Greek lexicon, which you know, you know this because it's been used, I'm sure, by other Trinitarians because I was told you've debated James White, even though I didn't see the debate. It comes from Theotes. Here's how it's defined. Uh, defined. Deity, the state of being God. Godhead, which you just decried. Godhead, right? Godhood, because Godhead is simply another way of saying Godhood, like <clears throat> uh, manhood. And then it says divinity as essence, difference from quality or attribute. That's all the text is saying. It's saying that Jesus possesses the absolute fullness of that which makes God God, the essence and all its essential properties, which Trinitarian denies it. But you equate it, Theodotos, with a singular person again. And I'm going to challenge you. Quote, one single Greek lexical source or a Greek scholar. Doesn't even have to be Trinitarian. Cite them to say that theodotos means the person of God, meaning the one person of God, as opposed to the essence and the essential characteristics of God. And I'm just going to stick to Colossians 2, 9, because if we go to Colossians 1, 13 to 20, we're going to have a field day refuting oneness and proving the triunity of God. But I'm going to just stick to Colossians 2, 9. So here's my challenge to you. You say you know Greek exegesis, and you're trying to exegete in order to give an impression that you know the Greek, and I'm sorry to say you don't. So quit, quote, one single Greek lexicon, one single Greek scholar that says theodotos means person, singular, who is God, as opposed to the essence and the essential characteristics of deity. Quote the source. Let me hear it. What's the evidence? Your time. Go ahead, Mr. Perkins. 
My turn. Okay, number one, yeah, I, I am taking uh, second year Greek, and that's exactly why I make the arguments that I make. From what I've seen in Mr. Shamoon's handling of original languages, I, I would guess that he's not had a, a lick of original formalistic university training. That's why he keeps making the mistakes that he's making. So regarding the term Godhead, Theodotos, or Tos here, uh, now correct me if I'm wrong, I gotta do it right now, but whenever I hand it back over to you, it sounds like Mr. Shamoon is saying that that the term Godhead does not refer to the what he would call the divine persons of the Trinity. I know you made that argument last week with Mr. Hedgeman whenever he brought it up. And yet the irony is the next day I looked on your Facebook thing and guess what you had there? You have an article on your Facebook link where you're talking about, I think it was William Lane Craig, if I'm not mistaken, and how that he they didn't agree with the Nicene understanding of the three divine persons in the Godhead. So now, whenever we have a verse that clearly refutes, yes, I hope we do go to Colossians 1, by the way, that clearly refutes uh, uh, Trinitarianism, now Mr. Shamoon has to wiggle a little bit and has to get out of it, whereas when he's arguing for Trinity and he's not paying attention to it and he's not trying to protect his religious tradition, then he says that, oh, well, that's referring to the persons of the Trinity. But then when we have a verse that says all the fullness of the divinity, it's an articular uh, divinity. Uh, you didn't address that. It's an articular uh, divinity that I would like you to say something about, at least, a tribute of article. And so it's definiteness. Anybody that's had a half a semester of Greek knows that you have, when you have an article prior to the noun, you have an articular noun, and therefore it's specificity. And so, um, what else? What other argument did he use? I think that's, yeah, oh, oh, so far as lexicons. Um, you know, we do not, I'm not saying that we agree with every single phrase that is used in a lexicon. I use that uh, incidentally, uh, however, no more than you would agree with everything Thayer said, whom you know was a Unitarian. No more than you would agree with the theology of the uh, paraphrase, what is it, the Targum. They, they were Jews. They denied your Trinity doctrine. So if, if you're going to charge me, okay, so if you're going to charge me with that, you need to take your own medicine because you do the same thing. We ready? Yes, sir. All right, notice the bait and switch again. Notice he keeps doing it. Notice what he just did. He appealed to the Greek in saying the definite, you know, it's definite, and therefore anyone who knows Greek would understand it's referring to the divinity. Well, I never said it doesn't refer to the deity. My question is, what does the deity mean? And the reason why he can't quote the lexicons to support his position, because no lexicon, no Greek scholar makes the point he did. He's butchering the Greek. So I'm going to reissue my challenge. Quote the Greek authorities that know it's definitive because the article is there before Theodotos. It's taste Theodotos. Quote any Greek scholar, whether Unitarian or Trinitarian, that made the argument you just did because it's definite. It has to mean a person. And notice what you did again, the bait and switch. Who's talking about Thayer's Unitarianism? Thayer's Unitarianism is one thing. I'm talking about his comments on the Greek terms. You can be an atheist and still know what the Greek terms mean. So I like this bait and switch tactic, but it's not getting you far. And you did it with my own words. You quoted something I said on Facebook where I'm using Godhead in a different sense from the way the King James translators used it. When the King James translators translated Colossians 2.9 as Godhead, they meant the same thing as manhood. Godhood, that which makes you God, like manhood is that which makes you man. Now, here's what's ironic. You've been appealing to the Greek, but now you abandon the Greek and you went to the English Godhead to prove. You see, you believe the God is a trinity. So the fullness of the trinity is in him. So what do you want me to do? You want me to stick with English? Abandon the Greek. You want the Greek? It destroys your position. Because the Greek word theodotos does not mean the persons or person of the Godhead. It simply means the divine essence and its essential characteristics, which is why you can't quote a lexical source or a Greek scholar, even an atheist, that agrees with you. So the game is over. Oneness is over. The Trinity lives. Glory to Jesus. All right, Mr. Perkins, you get a chance to respond to that, and you, you'll be able to go two more times. So go ahead and respond hey. to Sam. You, me, you no, he, he started though, so he's got the last word. 
Yeah, I, I was saying I was telling Mr. Perkins he has two more times. So you can go ahead, Sam will respond, and then you have one more opportunity. Oh, oh, oh okay. okay. I'm sorry. I, I we're all sorry about that. Good. Well, so so the it deal be, is I, well regarding the the my term, my expression about the Godhead, I'm pointing out Mr. Shamoon's double standards. And so far as quoting a lexicon, apparently Mr. Shamoon's never heard of the logical fallacy argumentum ad populum. Because when you appeal to the populace for your doctrine, we just always we just will always turn our collar around and go join up with Roman Catholics. We just will join up if we're in the Eastern world, go join Islam. Because if you're appealing to the populace and what they believe, then we're really in a bind. So I have not looked at every single lexicon, but I don't need the lexicon. The lex the Greek grammar and the syntax. I've already alluded to the syntax. I, I can do it again. Uh, if you're perhaps not hearing me, it's an attributive article. Greek demands that when you have an attributive uh, um, article prior to the noun, it is specificity. It's saying the divinity, all the fullness of the deity. I know you don't like that because it refutes your, your Trinitarianism. However, you have the article there, and I was pointing out your, your double standards regarding the term Godhead. Last week, you said, well, it don't mean the persons of the Trinity. And then the next night, you post something <laughs> on your Facebook that says it's the persons of the Trinity. So it sounds to me like you need to make up your mind. And regarding taking Greek and Hebrew, yes, this is exactly the point. That is why I reject the doctrine of the Trinity. I am forced to, if I'm going to be honest with the original language, yes, I want to be saved. And I want them to hear me to be saved as well. I have to, if I'm going to be honest with the inspired data. Back over to you. Middle and beginning. All right, Sam, go ahead and respond. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I, and I'm laughing because uh, I don't know what to say to such argumentation because he not only misrepresents the sources, he quotes, he misrepresents me. I never denied that it's definitive, that it's referring to the deity. Go back and listen. I never denied it. I denied his assertion that the deity somehow means the one person of God because he's assuming the Godhead, as he's defining it, means the person, one person. And I'm simply stating the obvious. The reason why it's definitive, because Jesus possesses the divine essence, and there's only one divine essence, but that doesn't mean there's only one divine person. You're butchering the Greek. And again, talking about logical fallacies, you don't know what a logical fallacy is because I'm not appealing to the populace. Because Greek language is Greek language, and like all language, it's governed by rules. So if you have Greek scholars who are studying the Greek language to know what those rules are and to discover how that language works, and they all say the same thing, then that means you're playing fast and loose with the Greek. You don't know Greek. You pretend you do, and they say little Greek is dangerous. Well, you are a beautiful example of that because that's why you abandon the lexicons and the dictionaries and the commentators. So they're all biased towards Trinitarianism. Thayer is not a Trinitarian, according to your own words. He's a Unitarian. But he admits Theotes, Theodotos, does not mean person, divine person. It means essence. And yes, Jesus does possess that essence that makes God what he is. But it doesn't mean it's a singular person. Because the Bible, if you let it speak, the Father possesses the full essence of deity as the Son and the Spirit. Because the Bible describes all three as being that one true God. And if you're one, that one true God, then you possess that specific essence that's true to the one true God. And it's not oneness. It's Trinitarianism. So even though you tried your best, again, you made my case. Glory to Jesus. Thank you, Mr. Perkins. <laughs> Keep going. All right. Mr. President, you turn? get the last word. You get the last word. Go ahead. Yeah, I will keep going. Uh, and that's exactly what led me out of Trinitarian churches is studying of the word of God. So, you know, I would really like to hear how much formal training, university training you've had in original languages. And no, this is not a debate over who's got the most Greek or Hebrew. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying the elementary mistakes that you make all the time with Greek and Hebrew, uh, uh, that is that indicates someone who is self-taught because the mistakes you make are unbelievable. Now, the reason that I'm saying one person is because of the context, the what is it? It's an adverb of manner, I think. Somaticos. Uh, yeah, the the term somaticos is for in him dwells all the fullness of the deity 
in bodily form, how many persons would that be? One. Secondly, you keep uh, adding into the text about uh, the, the nature, the essence. I'd love for you to show us where the word essence appears there. You are extrapolating your Trinitarianism and force feeding it into the biblical data so you can maintain your Trinitarianism. But the Bible itself does not use that expression. Well, in Colossians 2, 9 at least, it doesn't. We can go to Hebrews 1, Caractere, and we can go wherever you want to go. I don't care. But what I'm saying is, if you have not had any original language uh, classes, courses, and I don't think you have from just listening to you, then I don't think you should be <laughs> the one correcting someone else when you haven't you haven't even had a, had a course yourself. So that's all I will. Oh, oh, last thing. So far as the lexicons uh, saying that theodotes denotes a, what a person, I think. Then with that, using your argumentation. If we were to pick up a Hebrew lexicon, I'm, I'm saying if we're over there in Jerusalem and we pick up a native speaker Hebrew lexicon, do you think you're going to find the Trinity in there? Of course not. So using your hermeneutic, no one agrees with you, Mr. Shamoon. So now you need to abandon your Trinity doctrine, and I hope you do, and get baptized in Jesus' name and get into the church so you can be saved. That's all. All right. So I, I, I'll say this. And uh, before we go to the next before we go to the next scripture, I just want to remind both gentlemen that if either of you say something that you think that if either of you say something that you think is wrong, let's correct that argument. So if someone says something in Greek or Hebrew, let's correct that Greek or Hebrew. Let's not say uh, let's not focus on how elementary their teacher was or, you know, or whatever that is. Let's focus on Bible. Let's do that. Let's focus on Bible. So the next scripture that we will be going to is the gospel.